Hi, my name is Daniel Kitts. I'm a producer at The Agenda with Steve Pakin, and all this week I've been interviewing people about the situation in Sri Lanka in advance of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Sri Lanka this weekend. I'm joined right now by Amarnath Amarsingham. Uh, he's a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Refugee Studies at York University, and his PhD dissertation was on post-war Tamil activism in Canada. And uh, Amarnath, uh, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. I want to talk to you because um, the, often when we discuss different communities in Canada, Tamil community, Indo-Canadian community, we, we often in the media rarely take a chance to really look inside that community and really give up a more diverse picture of the discussions and debates that go on within that community and you being an expert on that I wanted to to talk to you a bit uh, about that uh, today. Yeah. My first question is when I was young um, and uh, starting out in journalism I did have a few meetings with um, some uh, members of the Tamil community in Canada you know about 10-12 years ago who seemed uh, genuinely afraid to um, speak out about their concerns about the liberation tigers of Tamil Elam, uh, any sort of disagreements they had with the direction of Tamil leadership. Um, I want to get a sense from you, I mean, how bad were things really back then? Um, yeah, I, I guess in the 90s it was, it was a bit different because, um, and, and th this is the key question, and how has things changed post-war, I guess, but before the war ended, um, the front organizations for the uh, LTT or Tamil Tigers were quite um, functional in Canada almost by design because they were tasked with um, you know keeping nationalism alive in the community, keeping uh, fundraising, propaganda, uh, putting out publications, organizing community events um, and those kinds of things with the kind of uh, theme of nationalism always present to some extent and 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 so that was very much uh, part of what the diaspora community at least the activist segments of the diaspora community were about uh, at least since the late 80s to you know when the uh, Harper government um, banned the LTT in 2006 and then banned the World Tamil Movement in 2008 uh, the World Tamil Movement um, was designated as a uh, supporter of terrorism and, and placed alongside the LTT on, on the list of banned organizations in Canada. Um, the fear that was present, and I've experienced some of this in the late 50s, uh, late 50s, late 90s, and, and, and so on, um, it, it's that there was a sense that if you were publishing things or organizing events or doing anything uh, Sri Lanka-related, um, there was always a kind of interference and always a kind of uh, air of threat that existed uh, in, in, in the community. Um, in addition to that, there was a general fear that, um, uh, I mean, I'll just give you an example. Uh, if I, coming home from school one day, I would find people uh, outside of my apartment door knocking, uh, asking for money, and my parents would send them away and, uh, and those kinds of things. So they were kind of an ever-present um, element of the community, uh, the fundraising uh, arm of it. Um, they also ran a lot of these uh, business directories in the community, so uh, they would come and ask businesses to put uh, their advertisements in, in their businesses and then get money for that. Um, I remember one time uh, a certain ad uh, that my father's business was advertising didn't go over well, or he didn't like the ad that they used, um, and then there was a kind of argument, and then they uh, a few weeks later our, our, the window was broken in, in, in our store and things like that. So, that it, of course, no one's ever prosecuted or no one's ever uh, followed around, but at the same time there's this kind of sense of you never know what's going to happen and, and, and it was just kind of a lot of young people with a lot of big egos wandering around um, and, and, and so that was the general climate I think pre-2009 or at least pre-2008 with the banning of the World Town Movement and maybe even pre-2006. Um, so I, mean, I, I think that's what you're getting when, when, when you had a lot of fear as you mentioned uh, trying to have these conversations in the 90s um, there was always that level of fear that you, you never know what you can say, what's going to cause a backlash, um, and, and so on. So now things are different. You, the LTT was designated a terrorist organization. The World Tamil Movement was also designated uh, a terrorist funding arm, I guess. And obviously the civil war uh, ended um, in 2009. So post-2009, 
what's the level of discourse and debate within the Tamil community compared to the period that you just described? Um, I think it's entirely different. Um, uh, I don't know if everyone in the community would agree with me, but I, I, I've noticed that it's a, it's a very lively discussion at the moment. Um, and that kind of grew out of the Tamil demonstrations of, of late 2008 and into 2009 in Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and around the world and so on. Um, what came out of those protests, I think, um, you know, there was no, there was no ceasefire, there was no um, inter, inter, intervention on the part of the international community and all of that. Uh, but I think it was enormously significant for the community itself to come together like that, have that conversation, uh, mourn publicly, grieve publicly, uh, and, and kind of solidify that identity of, um, you know, the community can actually do something, they can rally together when, 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 things, when something is called for. Um, out of that demonstration, or out of those demonstrations, uh, there was a lot of need or a lot of desire on the part of many youth uh, who were organizing these events uh, around university campuses around the country uh, to have a kind of um, conversation, right? And, and, and that, that's a kind of cheap word uh, these days, but I mean, have a kind of conversation about what, uh, what the war was about, how it ended, what to do next, what the diaspora's role is in going forward, um, so there was a lot of eagerness to have that conversation um, in all of its forms, right? So uh, critique uh, the Sri Lankan government, of course, uh, but critique the LTT as well, critique um, Tamil diaspora politics in Canada as well, critique uh, Tamil political parties in Sri Lanka as well, right? So the, a much more kind of multifaceted, in-depth conversation. And there was, an, there was an eagerness for that, and that's part of what drove my dissertation as well, because I, I, I noticed that there's a kind of renewed desire and eagerness for that conversation to happen so um, I thought you know it's a great topic to discuss with with all of the all of the protests that are happening and so let's take a, a, a deeper look at what's going on um, and the different conversations taking place so I, I think it is um, very much different um, I know some people who used to be activists in the 90s and so on um, hint that these kinds of conversations always went on uh, but I would suggest that maybe that a lot of those conversations were private in your own house and not so much uh, organized as events and so on, right? Um, if we, if, I don't know if you remember, uh, there, there, there's, there's still functioning uh, an organization called the Tamil Resource Center. Um, they're kind of a uh, somewhat leftist organization in Canada, not very well known in the Tamil community itself, um, but in 1994, their library in Toronto was burned to the ground. Right, their library that housed a lot of documents that they had uh, was burned to the ground. Particularly um, following an event that they, or a memorial event that they organized um, for an author who was writing a book about the leader of the LTT. Right, so uh, um, and, and and things like that. So th th these were kind of routine events. So I, I I'm I'm wondering how open that conversation was in the 90s if these kinds of events were happening. I don't think you would have anything like that happening post-war. Um, yeah, um, I, I believe when you spoke to me over the phone, I believe somebody made some kind of remark to you that your your PhD dissertation on post-war Tamil activism in Canada probably wouldn't have been done ten Doable. years. Ago. Is, is that <laughs> yeah, I mean, is that, uh, is that a reflection of, of how things have changed? Yeah, I mean, it's it's my postdoc supervisor at York who mentions this quite often, um, uh, and 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 I think she's I think it's accurate in a sense because the level of access that I received doing research in the community. Um, I spoke to members of all different organizations. Uh, the amount of youth who wanted to be interviewed was crazy. Um, and I don't think that level of eagerness to talk, as I mentioned before, uh, that eagerness to have that conversation would have been or, or was present before the end of the war. Uh, you, uh, you know, I spoke to people from all different organizations who simply wouldn't talk as openly before the end of the war. Um, and they would have just not be willing to have that conversation at all. So, I, and and if I was uh, critical of some of those organizations or critical of the LTTE uh, pre two thousand nine, at least pre before before two thousand six, let's say, um, it would have been quite a dicey affair, uh, right? And um, so I think that's what that's what, the, what that's what she means when she says it's it's not doable or could not have been done before two thousand nine. Um, and that's not to say my dissertation is amazing or anything. It's just a question of access that wasn't there, the uh, the, the level of conversation that wasn't there before uh, in the early parts of 2000 and into the 90s. That that is completely different uh, today. Mm -hmm.
Well, let's talk a little bit more about today. Um, during the war, the sense, at least from those of us on the outside of, of the community, was that the cause of Tamil nationalism was discussed almost exclusively in terms of a separate Tamil state. Um, yeah. Now that how, how's the conver how has that conversation evolved following the end of the war? Um, the public conversation uh, you're talking about the protests, the, the well, coverage of the protests, or before? Well, I'm just I'm just talking about you know really the, 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 when you heard people talk about the Tamil movement in Canada or, or, or the oh, okay. cause of Tamil nationalism, it was always talking about Tamil Elam, separate state. Um, that was seen as the the way for Tamil aspirations to be fulfilled, the only way, um, at least the only way that we really ever heard about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if there's more of a debate now within the community as to, well, how do Tamils in Sri Lanka achieve their aspirations of uh, some measure of autonomy, uh, protection of their rights, uh, ability to 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 progress in life. I mean, I'm wondering, you know, how has that evolved uh, since 2009, since the war ended, and the LTT was was defeated? Yeah, um, I think I think there was always a diversity of opinion uh, even before the war ended. Uh, the difference now, of course, is that it's a public conversation, and very much so in the in the Tamil diaspora. Um, or organizations exist and, and events were organized that cover a wide variety of different kinds of perspectives which I don't think you would have had like an organization even um, some of the events that we've had recently between uh, the Muslim community in Canada and uh, the Tamil community I don't think uh, would have been very popular or would have, would have even happened per se as or at least how they turned out uh, before the end of the war um, so the diversity of opinion I think always existed it's just uh, a question of people now think that that's a public conversation and or it's a necessarily public conversation that has to be had um, in, if, we're, if the diaspora is to have any role whatsoever um, in, in terms of what's happening in Sri Lanka. Um, so yes, the public conversation before 2009 was very much about separatism, at least the loudest ones were. Um, today uh, there is a kind of reformulating of that conversation and, and recognizing that um, there is a difference perhaps between Tamil nationalism and Tamil separatism. Um, so Tamil nationalism, I think a lot of people would recognize uh, the Tamil community and, and the diaspora, particularly the Tamil community as a nation unto itself, uh, which has its own history, it has its own uh, culture, has its own language, has its own uh, religious identity or, or uh, ethno-religious identity, if you want to call it, um, and that needs to be respected and preserved, and the diaspora has an important role to play in preserving that. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that all Tamil nationalists are separatists. Uh, they just mean that uh, it just means that within uh, a un unified Sri Lanka, some sort, some form of self-determination needs to be present. And I don't think that perspective is unique. I think the public conversation is unique around that. Um, but I've met people in the 90s who've argued that as well. Uh, they just weren't willing to kind of be activists around it, right? <laughs> Uh, whereas now, uh, you know, organizations exist with that platform, and, and, and that conversation is very much public and very much vibrant, I think. Um, and so at least that debate between those who believe in a separate state or those who believe that a separate state is not necessarily the only way to go um, is an important conversation happening, and I think it, it's a conversation that needs to happen uh, and continue to happen in the diaspora. And, and uh, in, in, a, in a funny way, it's a conversation that can only happen in the diaspora as well, because in Sri Lanka, you'll remember that with the Sixth Amendment uh, to the Constitution, any talk of a separate state is actually illegal in the country. Um, so a conversation, uh, a debate about separatism and nationalism uh, is, I think, uh, most vibrant in the diaspora because of that very reason. Um, yeah. um, well, l let me ask you, you know, uh, let's, let's uh, talk a little bit more about the different organizations within the Tamil community because I think the, the, the most well-known organization outside, uh, the most well-known Canadian Tamil organization outside of the Tamil community is the Canadian Tamil Congress, but it is yeah. not the only organization. So what, what are some of the, the major organizations in the Tamil community in terms of activism surrounding Sri Lanka? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's important that you ha add that last qualification because there are hundreds of organizations, literally hundreds of organizations, home village associations in the dozens, uh, alumni associations, uh, old boys and old girls associations, so it gets a little crazy. And then the settlement organizations are a bit um, active as well. But in terms of activism 
a Sri Lanka-based activism or a Sri Lanka-oriented activism. You do have the Canadian Tamil Congress, uh, which is probably the most mainstream of the organizations when it comes to Tamil nationalism, and, and at least officially, or at least many members of the organization uh, do believe in Tamil nationalism. Um, they haven't publicly taken a stance on, on separatism or not, but I think many people uh, within the organization do believe in Tamil nationalism. Um, a few other post-war organizations are the National Council of Canadian Tamils um, and the Transnational Government of Tamil Elam. Um, the NCCT uh, is a, is a started in 2010. It's an elected body in Canada. Um, and it... Uh, Within within uh, the organization, I think you would have a lot of conversation about nationalism and separatism as well. But I would say along the spectrum of, of nationalism and separatism, they might be closer to the separatist leaning uh, organizations. And the transnational government is definitely, at least officially, a separatist organization. Um, I've spoken to people in all of those organizations who you know waver between nationalism and separatism and the difference between the two. Um, but I think publicly, or at least officially, the stance that some of these organizations take are, are, are closer to the separatist uh, wing of, of the diaspora uh, community. The other organization um, is the uh, is Sri Lankans Without Borders, and they, uh, they're made up of an ethnically diverse um, uh, group of people. Um, they haven't really taken an official stance on Tamil nationalism because they can't really do that, uh, particularly with the makeup of their organization. So. Um, just to be clear, uh, just so that we're our audience yeah. is clear, Sri Lankans Without Borders includes both Tamils and members of the Sinhalese community, which is the majority community in, in Sri Lanka. Right? Yeah, so they include the Sinhalese community, uh, they include the Tamil community, and there are a lot of, um, uh, or some uh, of the burger community as well. Um, I don't know if they have any Muslim members, but I think they might. there might be a few. Um, so their conversation is much more based on um, promoting dialogue, promoting conversation, uh, pr promoting reconciliation, truth and accountability. Um, not to men not to say that the other organizations don't have that conversation, but it, 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 they do. There are having the pockets of conversation that exists on that spectrum of organizations is quite different, I think. Um, and at least the focus of, of, of those conversations are a bit different, and the end goal of those conversations are a bit different as well. Um, Sri Lankans Without Borders often is uh, dialogue-centric, uh, um, whereas some of the other organizations are, are um, they're activism-centric, if that makes any sense. Um, and not to, not to say that dialogue isn't a form of activism, but I think the, the, the focus or the emphasis is, is a bit different. Um, for many of these groups. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the, these groups obviously have differences in terms of their focus and, and how they feel Sri Lanka should proceed forward. I'm wondering how substantive are those differences versus how much are those differences based on timing and tactics, sort of details rather than major philosophical differences? Um, yeah, I, I mean it's a funny c question because I've, in talking to many of the leadership of these organizations, I'm, I often tell them, you know, if, if all four of you sat in the same room together, you would find yourself actually agreeing on quite a bit. Um, there's this assumption that there's this mass ideological difference between these organizations, but there isn't really. If you if you get down to the nitty gritty of it, um, many are nationalist, many are um, are very well, very much committed to human rights in Sri Lanka, very much committed to very much anti the, the current regime, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa and company. Um, so uh, there's a lot of agreement there. Um, there's even a lot of agreement on whether uh, to call what happened in the last stages of the war a genocide or not. Um, uh, so there's a lot of agreement there. Uh, what, what they, what they, what the difference is, is I think, um, on, on, for one, there is a disagreement amongst the leadership of many of these organizations, and that goes back historically to the 90s and 2000s and how these people actually got along with each other in the community itself. So many people who had very personal disagreements went on to find, went on to found different organizations that still function today. So the difference was just a, just a matter of personal disagreement with another, another, another person sometimes um, and not necessarily an ideological distinction. Um, uh, so you have that distinction, for example, with the CTC and NCCT to some extent. Um, uh, even though the CTC is a much older organization. Um, <coughs> in terms of tactics and timing, I think that's an important question as well. Um, the, the question becomes, 
how separatist do you want to be, uh, and, and whether if, if you say that separatism is necessary, or or a kind of de facto separatism is necessary, um, what is the nature of your critique of the government at that point? So if if you say, for example, um, yes, Tamils can live uh, happily within a unified Sri Lanka. Um, if their rights and dignities are respected, but their rights and dignities will never be respected, mm -hmm. right? So w once you get to that stage, then you become a kind of de facto separatist because you're saying that, yes, nationalism is possible within a united Sri Lanka, but a united Sri Lanka doesn't allow for Tamil nationalism. Therefore, uh, a united Sri Lanka cannot exist. Um, so the tactics for how to accomplish that uh, Conversation uh, differs if you talk if you talk to the Canadian Tamil Congress or if you talk to different kinds of organizations. Um, some some will go the international route and they see uh, human rights violations or, or war crimes tribunals as, as a way to achieve this broader political goal. Um, others will say uh, that it's just a matter of getting enough international pressure to, on 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 board. Or groups like the NCCT have recently argued, uh, at least some members of the group have recently argued that you know. Working with the West in general is is probably a bad idea because the West was complicit in many of the things that happened in the last stages of the war, uh, with the with the United States and so on, providing satellite support and and weapon weapon support uh, and, and those kinds of things. So how committed is the West um, to what happens to the Tamil community in general, right? Um, so I, I think there is a difference there in terms of what to do, um, and that conversation hasn't even come close to being complete <laughs> or I think I would say many many of that many of the more substantial debates are just starting to starting today um, or starting these days so and yeah yeah sorry no sorry to interrupt I just just so that I'm clear I mean are, are there any of these major organizations that feel Tamil aspirations can uh, be fulfilled within a united or a, a unitary state you know that that there is a way for uh, not just hypothetically, but th there is potentially a way in the real world for um, the unitary state to be able to accommodate, uh, you know, the, the the concerns of Tamils, or, or are all of them really saying it it, it can't work that way? There's got to be either some kind of sovereignty association, or provincial government, or or a separate state. Um, yeah, I mean, I think th I think there's an agreement that the current structure of the Sri Lankan government as a Singhala Buddha state does not accommodate um, minorities very well. Um, and, it, and, and so therefore the uh, viability of Tamil nationalism or at least the, the, the respect of, or at least a multicultural framework, let's put it that way, at, at least the possibility of a uh, multicultural framework in the country requires the reframing and the reformulating of the state itself. Um, and of course, many in the Sinhalese community, um, or at least many in the extreme wing of the Sinhalese community and the Sinhalese Buddhist community, would not allow a restructuring of the state to, uh, along those lines to take place. Um, and if that is the case, then then is it, it's then that you get that separatist conversation, right? Um, to say that perhaps um, if if a reformulating of the state is not possible, then perhaps a separate state is the solution or a de facto solution. Right. Um, and I think many organizations would agree with that or at least argue along those lines. Uh, it's just a question of where, where they fall at the current moment, right? I think, so I think um, Sri Lankans Without Borders would say, would be further down that spectrum to say uh, a, a reformulating of the state is probably possible. Um, a group like the TGTE or the NCCT would not uh, be along closer to that spectrum. They would be later on in the spectrum saying it, the government is not reformable, therefore a, a radical new solution needs to be thought of. Um, and so... Where would the CTC be in that, actually? Yeah, the CTC would be somewhere between the Sri Lankans Without Borders and, and NCCT to okay. say um, there, it, it, there's a possibility, of course, that some kind of reformulation could take place, but may, probably not. Right? Well, I have to ask this. What, what's the conversation around the LTTE these days? Um, in terms of support or... Well, just in terms of everything. I mean, the, the, obviously, before the war ended, I don't think there were really any organizations, prominent organizations, that openly criticized the LTT. But now that the war is over, and the LTT obviously um, uh, did some terrible things uh, to uh, to many people, uh, including some many Tamils. I'm just wondering if there's a debate about you know 
do we need to acknowledge the crimes of the LTTE? Uh, do we do we still support the LTTE in terms of the it, the fact that it, it it was advocating for Tamil nationalism and it was sort of a product of, in many people's view, you know, uh, Buddhist Sinhalese oppression. I mean, what what type of conversation is going on about how do we talk about the LTTE now? Um, unfortunately, it's in it's in a kind of infancy. I think um, some organizations like Sri Lanka's Without Borders are having that conversation. I think, and I think CTC uh, in in some of its press releases has said that uh, war crimes would involve an investigation of both sides and so on. Um, I don't I don't know if any of the other organizations would go that far, um, but a kind of true in-depth conversation about. Um, the LTT in Canada or, or, or the LTT in Sri Lanka has not really taken place in the, in, 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 uh, in the diaspora uh, per se. And when, when I say in-depth conversation, I mean recognizing the difference between Tamil nationalism, Tamil separatism, and Tamil militancy, and recognizing that um, what is the relationship between those three if the only manifestation, if the only militant manifestation of Tamil separatism has been the LTT, um, and uh, that, by extension, has resulted in the expulsion of the Muslim community from the north, the, uh, the, the attacks on the Tamil community, the intimidation of the Tamil community, um, and, and those kinds of things. Um, how differently can we articulate Tamil nationalism or Tamil separatism uh, in relation to that experience um, and, 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 and take, uh, take that uh, experience seriously? Um, I don't think that conversation has even started. Um, uh, so I, I think there, how people have rationalized around that, the lack of that conversation um, has been to say, uh, as, you, as you just said, um, that we have to recognize the original cause of the LTT. So to say that, uh, you know, don't worry about the crimes of the LTT, but recognize that they began um, as a reaction to uh, policies of discrimination and, and, and long-term uh, structural discrimination against the Tamil community. Um, and so you know, you have to ask, to ask the root cause of the rise of the LTT, and that's the more important question. Um, and many of those root causes continue post-war, uh, and so that's the important conversation, not necessarily the uh, crimes of the LTT. Um, I, I, I get that argument, but I don't sympathize with that too much. I think, um, I mean, if you travel in Sri Lanka, even, even briefly, you notice... Um, that many of the many of the peop, many of the trauma that people experience are not necessarily just by the Sinhalese state or the Sinhalese army or the Sri Lankan army. Um, that there have there has been much abuses by the LTT and so on. So I think to I think that's kind of a cop out argument. Um, it, it needs to be uh, there needs to be a much more sophisticated conversation happening about about where Tamil nationalism or Tamil separatism went wrong in its militant format. Um, and then what that means when we, or or if the community wants to re-articulate uh, some of those moving forward post-war. Um, but yeah, I don't, it, it's still, it's still just in. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, uh, I, I, you did mention, you know, that you travel in Sri Lanka, and I do want to talk about that. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I guess I should just, it's important to acknowledge, we've, we've talked a lot about how, um, the Tamil community relates to Tamil activism. Um, it, I think it's important to just acknowledge that obviously uh, Tamils are engaging in other forms of political activism. Uh, we have uh, Ratika Sistabasian, uh, a member of the Tamil community who's in uh, parliament now uh, for the NDP, and I believe uh, Nathan Shan, who's affiliated with the NCCT, is, uh, was elected president of the Ontario NDP. So obviously um, uh, Tamil activism doesn't just relate to to uh, exclusively Tamil issues, and, and uh, sure. I haven't talked to you about this, but I don't know if you have any comments about how that's evolved, uh, just because it is obviously important to, to mention that, that level of activism as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, I, I'm not too much aware of how it manifested itself pre-2009, but I can tell you post-2009 there's been an intense interest um, by many uh, in the community to get more involved with political activism, uh, mainstream political activism in Canada. Um, and, and part of the reason for that, I think, is um, uh, the kind of declining, um, how should I put this, the, the, the declining uh, faith or, or, or uh, declining faith in the Liberal Party of Canada as, as a way to um, kind of address some of the Tamil issues. So, the, so I, I mean, I would say the Tamil community is still majority 
liberal, uh, supporters of the Liberal Party of Canada, but there has been a recent trend where uh, a kind of diversity, uh, an argument has been made that, that the community needs to place its eggs in different baskets, so to speak, and not be totally uh, latched onto the Liberal Party of Canada. Um, which I guess, I mean, you know, Rathika is part of the NDP and uh, Nathan Chan is part of the NDP and there's been a few people who run for office as part of the uh, progressives, uh, the PC party and so on. So um, I think that's, you'll see more of that going forward. I, I think part of the argument has been, um, yes, it's involved in mainstream act, mainstream politics, but it, it's articulated in a way um, that has its roots, I guess, in how these parties have related to the issue of Sri Lanka. So that's never really divorced from the conversation. Um, yeah. um, and, and so, you know, the Jason Kenney's trips to Sri Lanka or um, his uh, act, his issues around the MV Sun Sea and the Ocean Lady, um, the NDP speaking out against these issues, that they're always, those dis distinctions and those differences are always part of uh, the conversation, I think. And, and so it is mainstream, but it's also very transnational. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about your trips to Sri Lanka because um, you've been to Sri Lanka and you've had an opportunity to talk to people there and obviously I, I'm curious to know what, uh, you know, your sense from actually having been there since, you know, many of us have not had a chance to go there. Um, uh, having been to Sri Lanka and having talked to some people, what's your sense of the priorities of the Tamils living there? Yeah. Um, my sense uh, from the, a few recent trips is um, that there's a surface priority and then there's a kind of much deeper priority. So the surface priorities are always um, looking for their disappeared loved ones, um, food, shelter, employment, uh, taking care of their kids and th th those kinds of traditional kind of uh, survival mechanisms. And part of that, part of the reason for that is there are parts of the Vanni region, which is just north, uh, just south of the Jaffna Peninsula, um, that are still utterly devastated, right? So the, yes, there are roads and so on being built, but uh, the infrastructure of the houses that they lived in um, are, are quite devastated. Um, and, and, and so there's been a lot of uh, issues of displacement and, and, and those kinds of things which people are still struggling with, uh, what is it, four or five years now, uh, going into the fifth year of, of, of the end of the war. Um, but I think if you just scratch beneath the surface quite a, a, a little bit in, in many of these conversations, um, a kind of a kind of nationalism still exists, right? Or a kind of, uh, I, I don't know if uh, separatism is the right word, but there's a sense of a deep commitment to the Tamil community as a separate cultural, ethno-religious group of people, and the need to preserve that identity is not um, has not gone away. And, it, and I, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not going to argue that it should go away, of course, but I don't think it is going away anytime soon, right? And and it's the same in the diaspora, where that that kind of separate identity is very much prevalent and very much uh, being articulated. Um, in, in you know the second or third questions that you ask them right um, so so that argument of it uh, or that aspect of it is, is is very important I think because there's a lot of talk in the diaspora now it's particularly people who go back and uh, go to Colombo and come back where they say you know oh the Tamils have moved on um, and, and and that kind of rhetoric is popping popping up quite a bit and I, I don't think it's accurate I think um, just by the recent Northern Provincial Council election results you realize that there's a deep commitment to Tamil identity and the preservation of Tamil identity. And when I ask people there, um, you know, who are you going to vote for and why are you voting for the Tamil National Alliance and, and so on, they say because you have to vote for, a, you know, you have to vote for a Tamil identity-based party. Like, how can you not do that, right? So it's it's a much deeper kind of commitment to uh, preservation of that identity, which I think um, is very important. Um, I, I I don't think I think militancy or that that the, the um, uh, want uh, or the commitment to an, another kind of military conflict is completely dead for the most part. I, I think people are at a point where that um, they've been beaten down to an extent where that is pretty much non-existent uh, but that does not mean that a kind of nationalism or even a kind of separatism does not exist in the country. Um, yeah, but I, but one 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 kind of definite thing is the uh, is the um, exhaustion with with the kind of armed conflict of it, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you've just 
described a, a fairly multi-layered and complicated list of priorities. Um, and I'm wondering how in sync or out of sync uh, are the Tamil diaspora's activities with the priorities of the Tamils on the ground that they are trying to help? Mm. Um, I think the diaspora or many of these organizations have latched on to that uh, latched on to the, that deeper commitment that I was talking about of Tamil nationalism. So that conversation still exists, um, and the diaspora can have it in a much more full sense while we're here. Um, that debate, anyway, can take place in its fuller form. Um, the the uh, war crimes conversation and the and and what happened in the end of the war. Um, I didn't hear too much about it when I was there a couple of times, but it's um, I don't I don't think it's also non-existent there. Um, what what I've been quite critical of the diaspora at least um, recently is is their lack of commitment to or lack of kind of deep commitment to addressing some of the earlier concerns that I mentioned in terms of development-oriented work, right? Um, and there are a few reasons for this. Um, and, and, and so you would assume, uh, you would assume, or at least all of the academic literature suggests that it is the mobilized elements of the diaspora who are going to be very much involved with leading the charge for development work in the country, and that hasn't really been the case. Um, you've had individuals doing the, that kind of work uh, quite often, and, and they'll probably continue to do it, and so on. But uh, part of the reason I think for the lack of development initiative in the diaspora uh, is one the divisions that do exist within these within these organizations and the leadership struggles that go on. Um, the second is a much more sophisticated conversation, which I think uh, needs to happen. Uh, it is the question of how ethically viable is it for the diaspora to get involved in development affairs in the country um, when that involves working with uh, the Rajapaksa regime who are they, with, who they are then accusing war, or who they are in parallel accusing of war crimes and so on. Um, and that gets complicated with the recent uh, work by the Rajapaksa regime placing the NGO secretariat under the Ministry of Defense um, and saying that if, if any NGO wants to work in the country, they need presidential task force approval and those kinds of things. So how ethically viable is it for diaspora groups to work with this regime to do any kind of development work? And that, that I think, is a very valid conversation that, that needs to continue. Um, the other side of it, I guess, I don't want to just blame the diaspora side of it. The other side of it, of course, um, is that the Sri Lankan government, unlike, say, the Indian government or the Filipino government, who, you know, the Indian government has a uh, Ministry of Overseas Indian Affairs, the Filipino uh, have a commission on Filipinos overseas, and, and who they actually target, the government itself reaches out to the di their diaspora and says, come back and do work for us or send money and so on. Uh, the Sri Lankan government, on the flip side, has basically branded the entire diaspora community, the Tamil diaspora community, as terrorist supporters, um, as LTT supporters, as... as uh, overwhelmingly committed to the vivisection or the, or the separation of the country um, and, so, and therefore the reaching out from the government side hasn't really been there either. Um, and you just saw this I think two days ago when uh, Chris Nonis, the um, uh, High Commissioner for the, of Sri Lanka for the United Kingdom basically came out and said, you know, uh, everything that we're being criticized for in the international media is primarily caused by the activism and propaganda of the Tamil diaspora. So, so there's no real acknowledgement of, of, of anything being wrong in the country. It's just the diaspora spreading false messages. So I think, uh, so I think in addition to the problems within the diaspora community and, and their inability to get involved with development work, uh, the Sri Lankan government's also to blame because they, um, they haven't been reaching out in any meaningful way either, and they've branded everybody a national security threat and so on. So... Um, uh, so in terms of addressing, <laughs> in terms of addressing the issue of development and, and 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 some of these earlier issues that I mentioned of of, of infrastructure and food and and, sust and sustainability, um, you know I'm not I'm not too optimistic about anything happening uh, anytime soon. Fair enough. Well, uh, I'm Renath Amrasingham, a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the Center for Refugee Studies at York University. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about all this. Oh, great! Thanks for having me.